I'm Megan Fox Kelly. I've been an art advisor for um, the last 18 years. Um, and I advise uh, private collectors, um, estates, artists' estates, and um, foundations in both buying and selling art for their clients. Um, I'm really here not to represent me, but to represent um, the APAA. And I'm so happy that I see a lot of um, our member faces here um, in the audience. So I hope that when we have question and answer that uh, some of our uh, <coughs> my, our members will, will also speak up and um, respond to some of your questions. Okay, there yep, we go. That's better. <laughs> um, uh, the APAA, we have about, we have over 115 um, members, um, and we are, we believe, the standard setting organization for the profession. Our art advisors advise uh, corporations in um, building corporate collections. Um, many of us work, as I do, for uh, private collectors, estates, and foundations. Um, and some, uh, you know, work consulting some of the biggest collectors uh, here in this country. Um, a few statistics, even though we are a, a small member organization, um, we did a benchmark survey to um, ask our members sort of the statistics of what we're buying and selling to get a sense of, you know, the, our influence within the market. And with about a 33 to 36 percent response rate, we found that um, in the benchmark years of 2010 to 2013, so it's uh, slightly older statistics, APA members uh, purchased nearly $640 million of uh, works uh, in works of art um, at galleries during that period. <coughs> um, uh, APA members purchased nearly $140, $94 million worth of art at art fairs during that period. Um, just 8% of our uh, members purchased um, $829,000 worth of art online in the year 2013. Um, and our members commissioned more than $10 million in art uh, directly from artists um, uh, during that period of time. 90% uh, of the artwork purchased overall by our art advisors is purchased from galleries. So the APAA um, has as its core a code of ethics that we um, go over um, uh, uh, continually and review and refine. Uh, we have expert counsel um, ad advising on our board uh, who helps to review our code of ethics and make sure that it is aligned not only what, with what we see as best practice but with um, uh, uh, with the law. Um, our code of ethics is sent out to our members every single year when they renew and send in their dues and they're asked to read and sign that code, code of ethics every year. Um, it serves really as a guide for our practices. Um, and we at APAA believe that um, it is the guide to best practices for all art advisors um, and it's governed by several um, key uh, principles that address the issues that that were raised by um, Richard and and Sean and Noah already on this um, panel, and and I think that this code of ethics, you know, even though it, it may seem complicated when you read through it, it really is for us a tool that simplifies um, a way of transacting transacting in what has become a rather complex art market. Um, first of all, art advisors are not dealers. Um, and as such, they do not own or represent inventory. While there are dealers who advise clients and there are museum curators who <laughs> advise their patrons and donors, um, they're different from professional art advisors who are hired to assist their clients, whether private or institutional, in building and in caring for their collections or helping them uh, to sell their collections. An art advisor has a fiduciary duty to represent their client's best interests at all times, as Richard already pointed out, and we're really cognizant of that as members of the APAA. Um, their duty is to represent their client's best interest, not their own, not a dealer's, an artist's. Mm -hmm. Oops, it's finicky. Yeah, it's a little <laughs> bit of a moment. Yep. Here. Um, not a dealer's best interests, not an artist's best interests, not an auction house's best interests, their client's best interests. Now their client could be, you know, an artist if they are helping and working for an artist or an artist estate, um, but they are, their duty is to the client. Um, an art advisor's fees should be completely transparent. 
Um, and there are many different ways to charge. There are many different ways that our members charge. Um, they can be paid either a salary, a retainer, hourly fees, fees based on a percentage of sales, which I think we should talk to um, when, uh, when we get to question and answer, um, or it can be a combination of these. Provided that the advisor is always paid from one source, preferably that that source is a client. A good advisor discloses those fees and uh, fee arrangements to dealers and auction houses with whom they interact on behalf of their client. Um, they therefore really serve as a facilitator on behalf of the client and the dealer and auction house or artist with whom they're working rather than as an obstruction. They're not something that's in the middle to get in the way of the transaction. They're there to facilitate the transaction and make sure that it happens smoothly, clearly, and transparently. Um, you know, when, when fee arrangements are transparent between an art advisor and their clients and the professionals with whom they engage, there are no issues or concerns. It's really just the simplest thing in the world. Hiding fees, concealing information on invoices is not best practice. It gets complicated, it gets confusing, it gets messy, and I don't know how people keep it straight. <laughs> um, contracts and agreements. Um, our art advisors, are uh, recommend, we recommend that they maintain written agreements with their clients that outline the nature of that advisor's work on the client's behalf. Um, and, and that can contain a clear recitation of how the member will be compensated. Um, invoices to the client also clearly de delineate the amount of compensation that is due to the advisor. Um, a good art advisor has an arsenal of contracts and agreements for their business. I certainly do. Um, I use letters of engagement for project-based work. <coughs> Um, contracts for ongoing relationships uh, with clients, um, agreement forms for when I'm bidding for a client um, at auction, um, agreements for engaging other professionals on a client's behalf, and this is something that in our in our own organization we have numerous programs. Um, you know, each year where we will speak to legal counsel. We have a counsel who is an affiliate member of our organization who's there as a resource to us and to our board in terms of how we transact. Um, and we utilize those resources and we are constantly learning about how to you know, operate um, most correctly within our profession. Mm -hmm. um, and all of these things and, and contracts and agreements protect the client but uh, the amazing thing is that they also protect the art advisor. So it's really a no-brainer to be employing these things. Um, simply put, they are professional and they are best practice. Um, an art advisor avoids conflicts of interest or even the appearance of conflicts of interest, including direct or indirect financial tr interest in a transaction involving their client. If they find themselves in such a situation, they must disclose the conflict to the client immediately. An art advisor does not perform services that are adverse to the interest of the client. It's as simple as that. So what would something like this look like? Well, you know, for example, maybe representing a client's collection um, for sale um, and then advocating another one of your clients to purchase a work of art from that collection. So you're you know, going from one collector to another collector um, without disclosing it to both clients. I mean, you can't do that um, in, in so many other fields that are regulated and yet it goes on all of the time um, in our own profession. You know, if you did happen to be selling something from one of your clients and another one of your clients has been desperately seeking that, well, it, then you simply need to disclose it to both of those clients um, and let them know that, you know, they, they, they are both clients and you're going to try and mediate an agreement between the two of them. If you don't disclose it, you're actually violating your fiduciary duty to both of them. And another aspect of best practice, which maybe doesn't get into legal issues as, as much, but Richard um, touched upon it, um, and that is expert expertise, research, and due diligence. Uh, a good art advisor is an expert in his or her field um, and does not provide advice in areas that are outside of their expertise. Very often we have collectors who will 
collect and be interested in a certain area um, and then off they go and they have an interest in something else entirely and to facilitate that you can bring in additional help for them um, and partner with an advisor who has an expertise who can help your advisor that's fine but you don't put out yourself out there to be an expert in every aspect of the art world it's virtually impossible um, advisors research should be careful informed and performed at the highest level um, our art advisors have years not only of education um, and uh, but also expertise and experience in their fields um, advisors exercise due diligence in verifying the accuracy of information <coughs> supplied to their clients regarding works of art so maybe that's less an issue in the primary market if you're you know buying a, a work of art that's just come from one Sean Ke one of Sean Kelly's artists but it happens more in the secondary market and when you're buying um, historical works of art um, you would need to verify simple things including the date of the work its provenance, its exhibition history, publication um, records, and an advisor should also be careful never to provide services regarding stolen works of art, um, and should exercise due diligence in researching clear title. Um, utilizing their expertise, undertaking proper levels of research, and exercising due diligence before providing advice um, is important for an art advisor. And then keeping accurate records of that ex of that research and due diligence in a work file is really part of their best practice. And so on our website and in these very nice cards that our <laughs> executive director Kim Meyer, who uh, came to this talk, um, sent around to all of you. Kim, um, is, Kim put up your hand. Yes, Hello, Kim, thank okay, you. Okay, right back. So um, this details a little bit about our organization <laughs> and on our website is a, a sort of a shorthand of our code of ethics, um, which is more extensive than that, but um, there are some bullet points there that, that indicate uh, you know, some of the points that I went over just now. Um, and so, really, this is what we hope is, is going to be a, you know, a, a guide for what is, we understand, a growing profession. Thank you very much, Megan. Thank you.